Caroline, come on up, please. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I hope I can deliver now. Um, so, yeah, I am involved in a couple of poetry groups, Poets and Patrons of Chicago, for those of you who are poets. Um, we meet in the Harold Washington Library and also um, Illinois State Poetry Society. We have a variety of chapters, one in Lyle, one in Hinsdale, and then some in Southern Illinois, um, and one in Northbrook, actually. So if you're interested, please come up to me. You know, you can give me your email address and we can stay in contact. Um, my first poem is called Shape Shifting, and it was inspired by a vacation in the Upper Peninsula with my husband, who's here tonight. Um, so, Shape Shifting. We're walking on the oldest rock in the world, basalt. It's part of the Canadian shield, he said. Striated black basalt formed from hot lava four billion years ago, later tilting and shifting to the surface. I hold your hand as we climb over wet stone and migrate through sand. A bird sings as the sun sizzles into Lake Superior. Earlier, we saw four snapping turtles laying eggs. Golden waves spin a quilt of gossamer threads as we sit on the ancient rock and watch the sunset. You tell me the LA Kings and the Devils are tied in the Stanley Cup playoffs. I hold some rocks in my hand, preserved, not fossilized. One a perfect oval, one a trapezoid, one a hooded figure, a wise shaman hovering over a drum, or a Ku Klux Klan member carrying a stick. Or perhaps it is an Indian chief bearing robes and headdress, or maybe even my father in his wheelchair bending down to pick up lost golf balls. Um, the next poem is also, was inspired by my father too. It's called Losing Control. It was in the early 1970s, and you thought it would be interesting to hypnotize your children. So, one by one, you sat us down, counting slowly to 100. I remember looking at a blinking Christmas tree light. You told me to close my eyes. Your voice was smooth, intoxicating, like the vodka tonic on the side table. We sat together for 10, 15 minutes, you feeling more in control despite each sip of your drink, me drunk on the attention. Now I spend quiet afternoons with you in your wheelchair. We gaze at the television, the voices of Dan Rather or Wolf Blitzer hypnotize our psyches. Now and then you close your eyes and I speak to you in hushed tones, coffee in hand. You worry about your finances as you grip the remote, the panic of losing control aching into each second, each minute, each hour. Uh, the next poem has a Latin title, for any of you who knows the dead language. It's called Navigare Vivere Est, which means sailing is life. And the poem's first two lines are taken from a poem called Jaconda by Aracelis Girme. You, funeral of sails, I admit to you I am not born of this. This way of leaving the sad hospital stay is when a ruby rash spreads its infection ripe across your jaundiced thigh. You open your eyes after the 20-second blood test and sweet water flows through your tired veins. Father, I admit to you, I am not born for this. This delusion creeping into every kiss goodbye. Why not let a slow canvas smile across your broken teeth and take everyone in this lost hospital room for a ride? You, funeral of sails, once bearer of dry wit, let us laugh again and open the jib, then glide in the current towards home. All right, so here's another one again, inspired by my father, but it's a, it's a little lighter kind of, but it's called Dangerous Driving. The car is a lethal weapon, my father swore to me when I was getting my driver's license. Still, I went on, laughing at him, driving to the most dangerous places, putting my foot to the accelerator. I received my stack of speeding tickets, and my father threatened to remove my name from the insurance policy. The car is a lethal weapon, he said again. Thirty years later, I press my foot on the brake and my foot goes down to the floor while driving on a busy Chicago expressway. I read the billboards, numb without stopping. I get my car fixed, then we take the keys away from my father, who is struggling with a walker from years of Parkinson's disease. The car is a lethal weapon, I tell him, but he still wants to drive. 
Okay. Um, thank you. This one was a little bit lighter, too. It's called Mom's Night Off. Whipped mashed potatoes, peas, carrots, and corn, all in their neat metallic compartments. I can still smell the Salisbury steak. It smells like singed bologna. I dip my fork into the vegetables, unseasoned, bland. Then comes a the dessert, steam rising from baked cherry compote or apple souffle, wonderfully aromatic, but still tasting like tin. It wasn't until years later when I understood why mom sometimes served us Swanson TV dinners on Friday nights. She got a night off, but we didn't care. For us, eating our meals on collapsible TV trays while watching the Brady Bunch was always a special occasion. Okay. Um, the next poem was um, written in a format, for those of you who know sonnets or villanelles or things like that. This is called a sestina, which you have to pick six words and then repeat them in a certain formula throughout the poem. So there's six stanzas and then a seventh stanza at the end. And I actually entered this poem into the Chicago Tribune's Printer's Row contest last year, and lo and behold, it, it won. So I was very pleased with that. So it's called Maple Lake, and it's about a place that my husband and I hike to. Um, quite often, in fact, so. Um, walking on frosted landscape, we hike alone. The crisp January air melts our bones as we make our descent to Maple Lake with sunshine and tracks in the snow. Slowly, we reach the river of ice now covering a home of native fish. Even in winter, men search here for fish. Despite storms, they are not alone, drilling holes and augering through ice huddling in small shacks to warm their bones. They sit and smoke and watch the snow softly stroke its print onto the lake. I follow you out onto the lake, thinking of how young boys catch fish here in May and June and how the snow keeps falling, each flake wet and alone. I wonder if bluegill have cold bones as they swim below the ice. I take a step onto the ice now covering frozen maple lake. The wind seeps through my bones. I think of what happens to the fish when winter comes and water alone is not enough to fight the snow. You begin to skate on top of the snow and leave your skid marks on the ice. I turn north and leave you alone, looking out upon the frozen lake, a deserted moonscape, except for the fish, which turn inward, embracing their bones. Who knows how deeply it goes to the bones when skin starts to wrinkle and hair to snow and men grow wisdom as they begin to fish, balancing each moment on bright skim ice, hovering between reality and myth, the lake a reminder of each lifetime alone. Yet we are not alone. Nature calls our bones back from the lake. We listen to the snow and petrified ice. Beneath us swim the fish. I just, uh, I'd like to read two more poems and one, one from each of my little chapbooks that I put together with artwork. Uh, the first one I put together, um, this is actually my second chapbook, but I put together with my mom's painting. She passed away from Alzheimer's two years ago. And she was an accomplished uh, acrylic artist. And some of the poems I wrote were actually about her experience with Alzheimer's and, and even some of the paintings she wrote, she painted when she had Alzheimer's. So. Um, uh, so this one's called Three Words. Just three words shocked me into submission, moiled my heart, wrapped their icy tentacles across my veins, sandbagged my joints like arthritis, pummeled my groin, sparked me into a seizure. Just three words in the emergency room, not the ones I wanted to hear, I love you, but instead do not resuscitate. Okay, so that's one poem. And then the next one, I'll try to leave you on a more lighter note. Um, this is a poem book that I put together with my friend Darlene, who is here tonight, and it's her watercolors. Um, with, and this is appropriate because it is an art gallery. Um, with my, I match it with my poetry. So um, this one is called Celebrating Six Years of Marriage, June 15, 2009, and it was inspired when I was in Alaska with my husband. Was it a mistake? to follow 11 other divers, mask on, breathing through a snorkel, head down, while gazing at the wonders of the Alaskan Ocean. Giant sea kelp, spiky urchins, red sea cucumbers, 
I turned towards the soft coral only to be shocked to see a grove of long grass like jonquils growing in the intertidal zone. I followed them. I couldn't help myself. I was reminded in one large sigh that you loved me and I reached for a tiny pink starfish. I looked up in a cry of exultation to see you floating nearby, treading water, while the other drivers, divers were far ahead. It was our anniversary and I was not alone at sea. Thank you. And the chapbooks are available for sale too. Thank you, Caroline.